First of all, let me congratulate you on the truly magnificent piece of mischaracterization that you gave us in this week's episode of Genesis Week. When it was late to appear, I had started to worry that the weekly misstatement of facts and denial of the bleeding obvious that is your weekly show was going to be skipped, in part due to you spending all of your time judging the best anti-evolution video in your little contest. It amused me no end that the video that you chose as the winner, the most effective at refuting the scientific theory of evolution, was in fact a philosophical argument that went along the lines of the Bible is true because it says it's true, but the theory of biological evolution is simply a scientific theory and therefore makes no claim about the truth, so you cannot be sure if it's true or not, so you should just believe in the Bible. Now, I'm not entirely sure how it made more sense than the barely understandable child ranting about how aeroplanes evolved into helicopters and had children, or how it addressed any of the assertions that the theory of biological evolution by way of natural selection makes, but I'm sure that it made some kind of sense to your avid fans. But less of that, let's get on with talking about this week's episode of Genesis Week. This week, you dissected and derided the recent scientific paper on the experimental evolution of multicellularity by William C. Radcliffe, Arford Dennison, Mark Borrello, and Michael Trafisano, in a way that made mouth-breathing morons the world over squeal with glee, and palms meet faces with a deafening slap. Those superhuman number puzzle solving abilities that only a Mensa membership card gives you, especially when all you have is a Mensa membership card and fuck all else, allowed you to chart a nimble and deft course through the carefully researched scientific paper, avoiding every single valid point and conclusion, resulting in a straw man so big you could roast a policeman in it. And that's not easy, given that the premise and the conclusions of the research paper in question are quite obvious and the materials and methods used are listed in exquisite detail, but given that it was the kind of selective breeding experiment where nobody waved stripy sticks at goats, I can understand your confusion. I thought that last week's ill-thought-out deconstruction of an MSNBC editorial was dire, but this week you have definitely overstretch yourself when it comes to comprehending scientific literature. More so, you are deliberately misleading your audience by concentrating on and saying that a centrifuge is required for the process to work, when the paper in question clearly states that it isn't. Allow me to clarify the method used in more simple terms, and explain exactly what is significant about the research that you were scoffing at, and the conclusions that can and can't be inferred from the results. The experiment set out to demonstrate how a uniform culture of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, otherwise known as brewer's yeast, which is usually seen as a unicellular organism, can be induced to behave as a multicellular organism. In simple terms, they set out to see if they could selectively breed a multicellular organism out of a unicellular organism, so proving that a single-celled organism could evolve into a multicelled organism if there was the right selective pressure. Now, Saccharomyces cerevisiae wasn't chosen by accident or at random. It was chosen because scientists have already induced this species of yeast to become multicellular, using various methods in the past. However, in this experiment, they were breeding the trait into the yeast and not subjecting it to adverse conditions or mutations. 
Basically, what they did was brew up ten identical batches of yeast, allowing them to grow for twenty-four hours while they subjected them to a gentle shaking, to keep the culture agitated and mixed up. Initially, they then transferred these into glass tubes and allowed them to settle for forty-five minutes before taking a one hundred microliter sample from the very bottom of the tube, which they then used to start the next generation of cultures. This next generation were also left to grow for 24 hours while being sh gently shaken, before they were transferred into glass tubes and allowed to settle for 45 minutes with the bottom 100 microliters being taken as a sample to be used to start the next culture, and so on and so forth for the next few days. After a few days, they realized that the sampling process could be made more efficient and more uniform if the samples were briefly subjected to 100 times gravity for 10 seconds in the centrifuge, rather than leaving them to settle for 45 minutes. Now in. You make a big thing about this, saying that subjecting something to 100 times gravity is outlandish. But really, it isn't. Gravity is measured as acceleration. And when forcing the sample to settle using the centrifuge, they are actually subjecting the cultures to less than half of the acceleration than what they were using to agitate them to keep the cultures mixed. You see, when it comes to centrifuges, the relative centrifugal force, which is expressed as units of gravity or times gravity, is a function of the diameter of the rotor radius and the speed at which the rotor spins. We can use the same calculation to determine just how many times gravity you are subjecting that rather smart red shirt of yours to when you put it in the washing machine and hit the spin cycle. Surprisingly, with a washing machine with a 50 centimeter drum, you can achieve 100 times gravity by spinning it at 600 RPM. Which on my washing machine is the slowest setting, and is akin to me swinging the shirt around my head. Now, if you spin dried your red shirt at 600 RPM for just 10 seconds, it would come out still sopping wet, so that gives you an indication of exactly how violently they spun the yeast samples in the experiment you are mocking. Now, consider that the basic bench centrifuge will run at speeds of up to 14,000 RPM giving a relative centrifugal force of nearly 22,000 times gravity, and that a super speed machine will crank it up even further, some running at speeds of up to 30,000 RPM, producing nearly 64,000 times gravity. And ultra speed centrifuges will go up to 2 million times gravity. We start to put a force of 100 times gravity into context. In other words, it's fuck all. And more so. As it's clearly just a time-saving step included so they don't have to wait 45 minutes for the cultures to settle under normal gravity, it's not actually required for the experiment to work. And saying that it is is a bit like claiming that you're a paleontologist or geologist just because you own a beige jacket with lots of pockets, a rucksack and a rock hammer, or that you are qualified to provide informed criticism of cutting-edge science simply because you have a Mensa membership card. Now, contrary to how you portrayed the experiment, gravity is a valid sorting factor, because in a liquid suspension, heavier particles will settle out of suspension first. I would have thought that you would have known this, seeing as it is how folks like you tend to explain rock strata, saying that the distinct layers found in sedimentary rock beds are the result of different materials of differing mass settling out at different rates during Noah's Great Flood. Well, because the heavier particles have settled out first, they will be at the bottom. And of course, these will most likely be the organisms that have clumped together to form multicellular groups. Now, these cells didn't group together because of any special treatment. They grouped together while in the yeast culture with all the other yeast cells, while the culture is being propagated for the 24 hours. As they were subjected to exactly the same conditions as the unicellular yeast, they could only be forming multicellular groups because of some inherent reason, such as genetic predisposition. As the experiment proceeded, day after day, transfer after transfer, with only the yeast most likely to form multicellular groups being used in the next culture, the yeast population changed to the point that almost all of the yeast was multicellular. 
And what's more, these multicellular groups of what would usually be unicellular organisms were behaving just like naturally occurring multicellular organisms, exhibiting things like division of labour and cell specialisation. In fact, if a sample of the final cell culture was examined under the microscope by an untrained individual, such as yourself for instance, and compared to the original sample that the cell culture had been drawn from just 60 days previously, the examiner would probably conclude that the two were two completely different types of organism. However, they're not. The clumpy culture of multicellular yeast is still Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Only it is a culture of Saccharomyces cerevisio that has evolved the trait of being multicellular. In fact, if the experiment was continued to the point where the unicellular trait was completely eradicated from the population, and the only individuals in that population were multicellular, you might even class the multicellular culture as a genetically distinct species, different from the original. That's how evolution works, Ian. It's about populations, and not individuals. Individuals don't evolve, populations do. And that's why biological evolution is defined as a change in allele frequency within a population over time. With an allele being a particular version of a particular gene, or even the presence or absence of the gene altogether. In the experiment, the population of single-celled organisms they started off with evolved into a population of multicellular organisms within just 60 days, when subjected to a suitable selective mechanism. And this mechanism need not be gravity. Gravity was used in the experiment because it is easily controllable and definable. In nature, the selective mechanism could be a predator. It could be the physical conditions within the environment, chemical conditions, or any combination of all three, and many more besides. You got it spot on when you described antibiotic resistance in bacteria. Yes, in the presence of an antibiotic, all non-resistant bacteria die, leaving only the resistant bacteria. That population can be said to have evolved antibiotic resistance. The resistance strain may not be as virulent or as vigorous as the original population, but it is a hell of a lot more suited to its environment than the non-resistance strains which die. Evolution is not about being the biggest, or the fastest, or the strongest, or some other conceived notion of an ideal. It's been about being the most suited to the environment that the population of organisms find itself in. Now, you might call that microevolution, but nobody in Syrian science has used that term for over a hundred years, because there is no difference between what you call microevolution and macroevolution. There's just evolution. Folks like you like to use the term evolution within the kinds, saying that one kind of animal cannot evolve into another. But you fail to define what a kind is, and you are unable to show any mechanism that would prevent a population of fish from evolving into a population of amphibians, and then into a population of reptiles, and then into a population of either birds or mammals. That's like saying that, on the one hand, it's entirely possible to eat one pie, maybe two or even three, but if you were given a thousand pies, it would be impossible to eat every single one. But Ian, we both know that given enough time, it's entirely possible for you to eat all the pies. That's no stretch of the imagination at all.